Well, we left off with Louis the Fourteenth um, controlling most of Central North America, with um, him bringing out the explorers that the explored the explored the the central area down the Mississippi River. So we have um, Marquette and Joliet. You should remember their names. Very important explorers as they went down the Mississippi River and explored that whole area. And then in 1682, we have Robert de la Salle, and he also, um, not only going down the Mississippi River, but he went all the way down to the, the, the Gulf of Mexico, and he established the city of New Orleans. So again, Louis now is controlling um, most of North America for France. Also, um, most of, of the central Canadian area, too, of Quebec. So France is owning lots of land and lots of colonies. And so, basically, Louis sending out these um, explorers. They're not bringing their families. So he's going to have to have a certain way that he can pay for colonization. So he gave them bonuses if they could bring people there, which meant women and children to colonize this huge area of land that France owned. Whew. So that was going on. And then in the meantime, he was really into um, art and building, of course, um, being um, the kind of king that he was. He wanted the greatest palace ever, and he was into the ultimate of luxury. And so he founded the, the Paris Observatory, and he also as, went in and studied himself, even architecture and music and science and sculpture and studying painting, and he got students to come in and to study. And not only that, he employed a lot of the artists and a lot of the architects to his um, building project. He took this hunting lodge that was 12 miles outside of Paris, and he built this magnificent palace called Versailles. Uh, it had 1,300 rooms. It was a quarter of a mile long. It took 27 years to build with 20,000 workers. The land covered 20,000 acres of cultivated uh, gardens and grounds there. And he also um, had it had his nobles and his military guarding this area 24-7. He met he let a lot of his military people that he liked best even visit and live at Versailles with him, so he'd have them right there with him. No other monarch could ever match Versailles. It was totally, totally um, just extravagant, beyond extravagant. And the French royalty became the fashion for other royal um, kingdoms to follow. And they became important. Not only that, you know, we find that even, even Russia was interested in Paris. Everyone was interested in Louis in Paris, how beautiful and how Paris just thrived during this time. Well, Louis had some other ideas too. Louis the Fourteenth, he didn't want um, he, to, the influence of Catholicism to be stifled in any way, so he went back and repealed the Edict of Nantes. Remember, the Edict of Nantes basically said that anyone, Protestant or Catholic, um, could worship as they pleased and they could live together. Well, um, Louis didn't like that idea. And of course, the cardinal that, that was under him, the priest, didn't like that idea. In fact, he decided to repeal that and get rid of the Edict of Nantes. And basically, um, when he did this, you know, thousands, actually 200 to 400,000 people at this, at this moment fled France. They left as fast as they could. They ran for their lives because they knew the next would be, the next, next edict he would do was have anyone who was not Catholic to be killed. Huguenot refugees, the Huguenots had to leave France totally for their lives. Thousands of workmen, workers fled, craftsmen fled. All these people, they had jobs, they had to leave. 
because they knew, and yes, he did, he persecuted the Protestants. He persecuted anyone that was not Catholic. Then the wars. He went on with the wars. Uh, four major wars a turn, um, uh, happened during this time. And the wars, he thought, would expand his power, so he was easily getting involved in the wars, although it cost France dearly. The first war was the War of Devolution, and basically that was a silly war. It was between the French and the Berber dynasty, which was his dynasty, and the Spanish king, um, the Habsburgs. It was weird because they both were Catholic dynasties and they both should have been getting along. In fact, they both had married um, each other. The people in both the royalties had married each other. They were like kinsmen, um, but they were fighting for control. As we know, France wanted to rule the world and the Habsburgs wanted to rule the, rule the world. They already were involved in um, not only in Austria, but also in the Netherlands, as we met. The, actually, what the whole war was about is who would control the Netherlands. And the Netherlands did not care for France or Spain. And the Netherlands, remember, they were Dutch Reformed. They did not want anyone controlling them. So this was, a, this, this was a terrible thing to be caught up. What a terrible and a very, very, I would say, stupid war. And the next war was the, the Third Anglo-Dutch War that went on from this point. And again, um, it was in 1672 to 1678. But again, it was had to do with the Netherlands. But this time, as we know, France and England have also been bitter rivals throughout history. They just decided to join together and come against the Dutch trade. Remember the Dutch people? They were trading and they had these huge ships and everything. Well, England didn't like that idea there, and neither did France. So France and England came together against this poor little country of the Netherlands. Well, it stopped the Netherlands. We know the Dutch Golden Age stopped, you know, then. And um, both England and France benefited from that. But the, the Dutch went on. They went on from there and did trade on their own. And then we had the War of the Grand Alliance, and that was 1689 to 1697. And Louis built up this huge army and navy, and he. Um, the focus of this war was who would rule Spain. Would it be again the the French Berbers, Bourbons, or would it be the Spanish Has Habsburgs? What a terrible war! It was mainly between two countries and their royalty. Well, the War of the Grand Alliance really meant they didn't want no country really wanted France to advance. Because basically, um, Louis was saying, you know what, um, I'm going to send my grandson over there to Spain, and, and he's going to become the king of Spain, and then France is going to own, not only be in charge of France, the French, but also be in charge of Spain. Not good. The last war was the War of the Spanish Succession, and that was basically just had to do more of the first war, um, where Philip V, his grandson, um, thought that he would become king of Spain. So when you look at these wars, they're really, really crazy. This last war was signed with the Treaty of Urecht in 1713, and that guaranteed that a single monarch could not rule both France and Spain. So Louis didn't win. The end of Louis the Fourteenth. We know that every Every um, king has an expiration date. You have to die. Uh, Louis, Louis um, he actually reigned for 72 years, which is the longest, and, and Louis's great-grandson, Louis XV, reigned after. We'll find out what happened, because we're getting into the French Revolution there. We'll find out what happened to Louis the, um, the XV and his wife, Marie Antoinette. She's the one that said, well, they said, the people have no bread. And she says, well, let them eat cake then. Mm. We'll see what their downfall comes. But anyway, going on with Louis the Fourteenth, the Peace of Westphalia, remember we talked about that happened. Um, and, and France became, France after that, even the peace became a leading power. But because Louis... He um, led expensive building programs. 
and he left France in a in a poor economic state because he used all of the money, you know, all their money they could in building his great palace, and he did not really achieve his dreams of con of conquering the whole world, did he? Uh, after his great grandson followed him, it wasn't too good. French people were exasperated by the arrogant and greed of Louis the Fourteenth and his successor and they were ready for a great rebellion. And we'll talk about the French rebellion, <coughs> um, the French Revolution, which was terrible in many ways. Because Louis had abused his, uh, his position of authority and he had the opportunity to do good, but he um, did a lot of harm. The rich were so sickly wealthy and the poor were starving in France. Oh, kings. Who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords? We know that Jesus is. And he came in poverty. But we know he's king of our hearts. He's, king. he's going to come again as king of kings and lord of lords. And all the angels say, holy, holy, holy. He's our, the love of our life. No king, no ruler could fit into that spot in any way. And the king has failed much. And Louis XIV, yeah, he, he did some things to help France, but most mostly the French people looked at him as a problem and because he really didn't care for the poor people. Basically, he cared that he would be the Sun King. Hmm? Not a good thing for France. I don't think we, we need a king like that, do you?